Yeah. Yes, I'm a gerontology student. I mean, I graduated first. I'm first. Okay, let's go a little bit back. I'm chemical engineer uh, by education from Russia. Immigrated to United States. Uh, then I was homeschooling my children for whatever, 12 years, I don't know, 15 years, I don't remember. <laughs> uh, then I went back to PCC to study gerontology, first for my own sake, to learn how people age in this country. Mm-hmm. And then it got, like, I got really deeply involved. And uh, now I'm thinking about sharing what I learned and helping other people age. So I graduated this summer with two certificates from uh, PCC, uh, Advocacy and Activity Professional. Um, I had all the credits for dementia, never mind. So anyways, uh, and I developed uh, with guidance of Roger, a cognitive activity uh, program, which I am testing in different settings, uh, hoping to help people age well. I champion you. Congratulations on your graduation. Wow. 15 years of homeschooling by a chemical engineer. <laughs> I have homeschooled uh, several years and I was in, in I was a classroom teacher fourth grade on down. So I'm applauding that. And now you're going to help me to age even better. Oh, and everyone else. And I get to meet you, and Bill gets to meet you here. Bill. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is great. Do you, uh, you know what? I'm, I'm going to have Bill tell you more about himself, and I'm going to listen in because I need to know, too. I know, I know he's been in pictures because I've learned LinkedIn, and, and I've kind of, taken LinkedIn and, and, um, wrangled it down, um, to where a person who doesn't have a background in social media, but does have a background with people. Um, at one point, um, my best friends were 96. I just seemed like I had, I was with a lot of different people in that era of caregiving and assisting that were 96, but, um, Bill, Tell Natalia a little bit more about you. Well, first, I want to answer your first question before my voice went uh, nuclear or something like that. <laughs> so oh. I go by any variation on William, um, Bill, Willie, whatever, uh, except I like to tell a story that a friend going back to elementary school all the way through college. Uh, my neighborhood, and she lives in Berkeley now, and I'll see her, and she said, can I still call you Billy? You can. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my she was my first crush. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, so uh, to answer your more important question, so uh, what Natalia especially doesn't know, I was my mother's caregiver. It was a 10-year journey. Uh, She passed away 10 years ago from Alzheimer's at age 83. And what I like to say often is if you had told me what was going to transpire from about the mid 2000s to uh, the last few years, what was going to happen with my mom on my journey with her, I'd say, you're crazy. You couldn't make up that scenario. It was just unfathomable because part of the story is Natalia, Roger knows, I think Christine knows, my mom lost her home in Katrina in Biloxi, Mississippi, mm-hmm. and she was showing signs before that. Uh, and but that day, everything changed because not only all the ramifications recovering mm-hmm. and supporting her, my stepfather, but the trauma of seeing her home mm-hmm. gone just exacerbated, accelerated what whatever was coming on with her. We knew later that it was Alzheimer's. So what I like to say, a long story short that I turned my personal loss, my pain into my passion and my encore career. Because I used to work for the state of Oregon in a completely unrelated job uh, mm-hmm. with ODOT, Department of Transportation. So you can kind of get the, the picture there. And I thought when I was approaching retirement, 
then I was just going to do more volunteer work, support groups, and mm-hmm. all uh, fundraising and advocacy at the Capitol. But then I came across this concept of a caregiving support consultant. Uh, I provide advice, support resources to family caregivers, help them put together the care team, the care plan, collaborate with my A team of, uh, of advisors mm-hmm. and uh, professionals. And I'm also a certified senior advisor and now a, a trained elder mediator. So I love what I'm doing. Oh my goodness. My, my hubby producer, D Scott Smith, motivational listener, who's always wanting to just stay in the background during this hour and is always so glad that he got to listen in at the end. He puts comments up on the screen. I'm going to start with Michael Holt. He is also in the Portland area. Michael and Scott got together just a number of weeks ago while I was visiting my mom in the Portland area. So we drove up together and I was just a little bit jealous. And Michael goes, I love it. Still learning and growing so that you can serve others. Oh, and then he thanks me for, isn't that amazing? So many different people call this a panel and I'm, I tend to call it a picnic table uh, because I, I don't practice ahead of time and make sure I just, I just ask each of you to share you know, ways that people can get a hold of you. And that'll happen at the end. Um, Mm -hmm. Natalia is new to this. So it's Michelle. She just came in. Mm -hmm. I am so happy to see you. She said, I might be a few minutes late. And I'm like, late is great. Because that means that you were interested enough. You're like, wait a minute, I want to get in on this too. And I've got some reasons. Um, Another person who's put in Um, a message this morning to champion you and cheer you on is I believe from outside of Oregon, we're all in Oregon. Actually, Michelle may not be over the border back home yet. She's saying, yes, I'm going to get her talking in just a moment because her, her situation is also pretty special. Um, um, Steve Berger. Yes. Um, He's greeting us from Naples, Florida, and he is looking forward to hearing what you are all going to be discussing because some of you already know each other. Michelle, I'm going to go right to you just to make sure your sound is working because you have halted everything to come. So welcome. I'm so glad to meet you, Michelle, after all this time of just looking at your picture on the screen. Great to see you again, Michelle. (gasps) Yay. How's your how's your sound? Oh, we can't hear you, but apparently you can hear us. Let's see. Okay, she muted and she's going to give it a try. You can hop in anytime, Michelle, right in the middle and let and to see if it's going to work for you to talk. Um, yep, we're still not hearing you. And also Jesse Maruka, he has actually been on as well as Steve. And Jesse is in Florida as well. So we're we're pulling people in on our Oregonian time. By the way, when I was trying to text us Oregonians to Roger, I was just, you know, waving him down, going, I'm gonna see you in an hour. Um, it, my autocorrect goes to oregano. So we're, that's, that's what it thinks I'm, and I'm going, do I even ask my husband pick up oregano from, so I don't know where that pronunciation. Yeah. Yeah. So we're original Oregonians, oreganos and, and, and all, Ooh, try again, Michelle, see if we can hear you. Nope. It's still quiet, but Hey, we've been playing with, We've been playing with tech this morning with Mm -hmm. Bill. Roger, this is probably your third time in Aspects of Aging. And I'm just going to let you talk to me because you and I should have met face-to-face by now, like in a grocery store or something. Go right ahead. We never have met uh, at that grocery store or farmer's market. I think that's where we'll probably meet. When you said you this is a formal gathering, it's more like a picnic. It's more like a potluck 
we all bring food for thought, so run with that one. And and what I really like is when you gather people like this, we don't know what we're going to talk about. And I've already marked next week just because I know we'll run out of, not time, we'll run out of ideas at the end of next week, maybe. But what I want to do is to listen and also contribute something I think all of you have, and that is you've got something like Natalia will tell you about, and it's not the end of cognitive issues, but it's a tool that can be used. And if we have enough tools that people are attracted to, that's going to make a difference because it tips the balance. Part of it is just getting someone away from things they think of as negative, and you don't do it by distracting them. The new concept is you attract them to something that they loved once in their life. It's called the lived experience. And so maybe next week I'll ask for some solid time to talk about a presentation I did at Portland State just before the pandemic hit on precision applied reminiscence therapy, B-A-R-T, and what it's based on is precision medicine and also OHS used precision immunotherapy. Target that one person's cancer, target that one person's medical problem precisionally at the beginning. And so if we know someone loves Lego as a kid or watch their, watch their kids build Lego, what do you do? You don't have them do something they've never done before. You do something that they once did, and even if they're observing and can't physically do it, the mirror neurons pop in and they are almost as good as actually doing what they used to do. So it's a time travel concept. I saw evidence of that. A gentleman who does um, videography posted something out and it's probably been reposted everywhere. So he was watching... Um, a younger lady, um, they, they did have some, some prompts at the bottom of the screen to help you know what was going on. A younger lady and another uh, woman are approaching um, a gentleman who's seated. He has a cane next to him. She comes around and does what I've seen Tipa Snow do so many times, make sure that she approaches at the right level and, you know, touching just, just so to, to let this person know I'm approaching you, even though they have sight, but so as not to startle them. This gentleman was an artist all his years. He did art with other people, taught other people. Um, she, she drew his attention after he said, do I know you? She said, I'm a friend and I'm, I'm, uh, a, a happy part of your life or something like that, drew his attention to the paintbrush. Maybe four or five strokes later, he turned and said, you're my little girl. Oh my, you're so beautiful. And she bursts out very gently, daddy, today's the day. He goes, you're so beautiful. And he kisses her hand over and over. She said, the people are here. Today is the day. She's wearing her white dress, her veil, and everyone's being so careful not to make loud noises and react as he and she continue to do the aisle walk. And um, right now, I just touched my arm, and there come I. I cried. I watched it several times, but that was a part of his past something they did together that's specifically why she had the paints set up so that he could start doing what he had done before and that was oh uh, and he and he found himself again and he and he discovered her and he had the joy of the moment and everyone else did too and oh, i kept watching it <laughs> um natalia you said something earlier on that helped me to realize that although a human being who was born uh, in any politically lined or geographic spot or, or climate was born or raised or 
continued their uh, maturation in any sort of culture, you want to, dis to discover the culture of U.S. aging. And yes, it is different as a culture, as a group, reactions, etc. Can you talk more about that? Uh, yes, and one of the uh, challenges which I really welcome is uh, when I work with people with dementia, they have their culture in, like we relate to their experiences in the past, music, movies, and everything. For me, it's all new, right? So when I go and volunteer and day services program, I've learned a lot, you know, listening to those songs and watching movies. For some people, it's reminiscence. For me, it's a it's a lot of material. It's a lot of learning going on there, just sitting there, because I have no clue who, whatever brothers are, <laughs> what song they're singing. So it's it's really exciting, but it's also uh, absolutely necessary, and it cannot be done in a. Um, classroom environment right because in classroom we'll, we don't learn this kind of things and it's it's very uh absolutely mostly most important for working with people with dementia and with all the other people too because you want to connect with their culture and their past too so that's one of the challenges uh, there is because I can, you know, jump in very happy with my Lego bricks, uh, but to make that connection, I need to have some cultural, shared cultural background. So, yeah. Oh my. Okay. So, Lego. Well, have, Lego yes. Are you, yes. Are you familiar with Patty Sharon? Yes, that's that's Good. a person. That's a person who uh, told told you about me, and I met. Oh, her. that was yes, and I met her, met her at Lego convention this year in Portland. I mean, we were communicating virtually for quite some time after she wrote her book. We were communicating, uh, but we met in person and had an absolutely great time. And we are going to meet next year, of of course. <laughs> So yes, uh, she is she is very darling and she's a very helpful person and very passionate about helping people. Yeah. Oh, when I'm going to head for um, a, a large gathering of anything, Portland seems to be the spot where everyone knows we'll we'll get a lot of people involved if if we have this in Portland. Um, Age, oh my goodness, I'm going to say the wrong one. But anyway, there was an awards gathering in Portland that brought me up there. And it was Ageless Awards for Age Plus. Mm -hmm. And so I got to see just amazing people in person talking about why they were being um, honored. They had to be 75 or better in order to be honored. And then I went back for the scam jam and how not to be scammed and um, exploited, uh, particularly financial or um, your, your personal information. And it brought in the attorney general, um, Ellen Rosenblum, and it brought in you know, a guy from the TV station and a guy came down from Washington who's retired with AARP, but he had, a, you know, a lot of information to let people know, you know, it's like, you don't have to know everything about how they can scam you. You need to know how you set your feet and go, this is a potential scam and it's much better that I push aside, that I have a script and I push aside in a, um, whatever is coming towards me on my screen or at my door, or in my mail or on my phone, um, how I push that aside, but still retain who I am because you've been taught to be polite and to respond and, um, you know, to be helpful. So that was really great. But Portland, a lot of things happen in Portland. Bill, you mentioned that Tipa Snow was in person in Portland. 
Yeah. Was that really? how recently? Uh, I believe it was uh, around June 21st, right around the longest day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, if I'm not mistaken, I wasn't able to make it this time, but I've seen her a couple times in recent years. Absolutely. Oh my goodness! Yeah, some of a couple of my people in my support group went, and they loved it. Even one who had just lost his spouse, he had already reserved for it, and he says, "I'm going anyway because I can always learn more and come back and share with the group," which is the way they are. I mean, that's how I, my experience with a support group. That's why it's so important. I get a little topic here. Sorry. Uh, because yeah. people were so supportive, even though they had already lost their loved ones. And I did that for a little while after my mom passed away. When I became the facilitator. I'm still so leading the same group 18 years later. But it's it's that kind of community. And I mean, we have a, I'm not saying that we're perfect. Uh, we know about the healthcare industry has a lot of uh, room for improvement, shall we say, and coordination and compassion. But we have a very healthy, you know, healthcare community uh, with all the major systems and a, med and a research uh, uh, med uh, medical school, Oregon Health Sciences University, with a wonderful, the latent Center for Aging. So, and then a very vibrant Alzheimer's Association. All those issues are there. Uh, did you, met, you mentioned the guy from ARP was from Washington or from Oregon? Because I know about Jerry Cohen. Yes, I've met Jerry Cohen. Thank no goodness. <laughs> Vicki Schmal started Jero Conference 46 years ago. And I, and I ended up next to her for the breakfast. And um, I believe I met Jerry there. And I've seen him on screen a few times for AARP Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, this guy, ooh, I want to say his last name, Shadel. Somewhere in this mess on my desk that you are not allowed to see is his name. Um, but yeah, he was AARP Washington mm -hmm. and he was brought in for, for talking as well as uh, an assistant. She said, um, she gave me a baby shower. So we're pretty close. Um, Ellen Rosenblum's assistant is also Ellen, Ellen Clem. She also spoke. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, people who have, I don't know, clout, they've got you know, a gravity well, um, you know, we're, you know, jumping in. And one of the speakers just happened by, and I, I tend to be talkative and, you know, engage people. And, and he goes, man, I am so thrilled to see this many people. It was being held at OMSI, Oregon Museum, Science of Industry. Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. So we walked past, you know, the sound of children and displays, and I had to go through the solar system to get to, to that. But um, you've, you've probably all been there, and maybe even as kids when it was smaller and uh, the nearer, <laughs> nearer the zoo. That's right. It was now just- the water break. Yeah. Another great annual uh, conference, and I, I know Roger's aware of it, I don't know about Italia, is the uh, McGinty Conference, which has been going on for many years, which is an Alzheimer's conference, oh, usually in the fall, I believe November. Uh, it's an all-day conference of uh, seminars and talks, updates on all the research and breakout rooms with great speakers, it's, and it's a great opportunity to talk to other caregivers, network, talk to the vendors, a uh, great thing that, and it's free for uh, Oregon caregivers. It's all, this is all sponsored by the legislature through, I believe, Oregon Care Partners, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So. Has it been going on for a few years or just Many been years. recent? No. Many years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I was a hired caregiver um, last decade. Mm -hmm. And yeah. there's just so, so much that we don't know about that's, within a short drive or walking distance or, you know, you're just going, you're kidding. That's what you, we have something in common. That's part of why I just wanted to have an Oregonian gathering so that other Oregonians can go, wait a minute, this is, this is possible. This, I mean, I don't, I don't have to, become an expert or spend a lot of money and go to a conference that's somewhere else. I can go for free to the McGinty 
conference. Okay, I need to look that one up. I like to use the analogy of, because back in the mid 2000s, if you think, what was a something like locally retirement connection guide or how much was on the internet? Almost nothing. It was basically the old phrase. I think we're old enough. Let your fingers do the walking through the yellow pages, right? Uh, I mean, the younger people don't know that one. It's like they don't know how to do a rotary phone. <laughs> but but that's what it was. Why do we say and then you didn't know what you were going to get, right? <laughs> and and yeah. this, raising the McGinty brought back a flood of memories. And Christine, uh, my involvement was a couple of keynotes, and I met some of the scientists who speak plain English when they get into the McGinty because it's something that is more of an engagement rather than an audience only listening. And I'm going to predict that if you go, what you'll be able to do is get a notepad, take Scott with you, and you'll be able to spot a speaker, go to them afterwards and see if they might want to be a guest on, because you've got something that's based in Oregon. And Oregon has always been thought of when you go back east and you do something and they hear you're from Oregon, they've heard about the innovation the first assisted living community in portland all these different things in portland start so that's a rich group of oregonians and people connected with oregon is mcginty coming up it's in the fall mm -hmm. oh wonderful okay writing that down there's something else that's in oregon and natalia you said something about when you go into the um, adult day services, did I hear mm -hmm. you correct? Yes, yes. I volunteer there weekly just to, I mean, to help, obviously, but it's much more beneficial for me to learn how to do things because I don't know if you know uh, Nancy Hackler from uh, Cedar Sinai. If, I mean, this is a top notch, whatever you can dream of. This is your place. She That's where is. My mom was. She is ahead of everything. When I sometimes I go for presentation, you know, by by uh, conferences, Nancy is ahead of that. She's not. She's doing it on the ground. And I told her once, Nancy, if I ever get Alzheimer, I want to. I want to be here. Period. I want to be in this place. So mm -hmm. I go there weekly. I help them, uh, and uh, by mostly learn see how she does it in her program and learn cultural things and it's she is a person just wow mm -hmm. <laughs> yes and this is um sinai cedar I... cedar, cedar sinai adult uh, day services yeah nancy heckler that was one of my mom's favorite people uh my mom was started over in the uh the assisted living uh schnitzer manor uh she was there <laughs> less than a year and then she was in the old robeson before they renovated it four years in their secure memory care. Uh, and what I like to say is that it looked like the old nursing homes because it used to be that, mm -hmm. skilled nursing, et cetera, but the care was wonderful. Mm -hmm. That was the most important uh, thing. In fact, the head nurse, I don't know if you ever met Ronnie Schechter, Natalia, but she was at Cedar sinai over 30 years and just retired not that long ago. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, they Cedar have a lot. They have a lot of people who work long hour, long years, like like 20, 30, like really, right. they, they keep their people. Right. And um, when you think about how so many care communities and agencies are struggling for staff, high turnover. Mm -hmm. And if you hire well and you train well and you promote and you recognize, you will see that they'll be there 5, 10, 20, 30 years. You know, it's unheard of nowadays, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, I worked with or worked under the de the department that sent people to private homes, and this was um, Albany. It's Mennonite Village, and they started with you know one building saying we need to take care of the people who has have no one to take care of them. We need to do well for our own community within Mennonite. Well, they have multi-levels now and you, and they actually list, you know, happy anniversary to so-and-so 15 years, 25 years, 30 years. So another situation that is um, staying true as true as they can to the original 
premise of let's take care of them and let's take care of our workers too. I loved working for them. They would send me anywhere in two counties. Um, but I could also, all of us in that department could um, be there for someone, even if it was one hour once. Um, so it was, it was very nice um, for those who were living more independently in that community. Also, just south of Roger and I in Corvallis, the um, Grace Center is Adult Day Services, and they were awarded number one out of 6,400 across the U.S. And I cannot, <laughs> I'm just like, I'm, I'm actually going to be in Corvallis today, and I'm going to drop by again to see Renee Knight. And it's like, what, what, what has been done right? Obviously, a lot of places are doing fabulous, but number one, I just got their letter in the mail um, a few months ago because I went to their aging summit. I wanted to learn more. I wanted resources for both caregiving people and um, family caregiving people and my best friends, the people in their seventies through hundreds that, you know, it's like, is, is there something for me in that's different? You know, my background is this way. Is there, is there a grouping? Is there a way that I can continue my enhanced living? You know, I, I, I'm thrilled that there are resources and this is my way of, of making sure people know them more. We're only at the halfway mark. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and get ahead of the train just a little bit so that we can just relax and share some more information and more stories. And um, like you said, you turned your pain into passion. That has happened over and over again. I, I think maybe some of the best stuff happens when someone goes, I have got to make sure that everyone else, someone else doesn't have to muddle through and have difficulty with the finances or, or the equipment that's, that makes um, my loved one more comfortable or whatever it is. I, I think some of the best stuff comes out of the struggle um, rather than, oh, here's a product, you know, I'll sell this. Um, if you've been through it yourself, whatever it is, the condition or the emotional strain, um, some trauma or something, you pain is a motivator. Um, you end up putting things together. So I always show this to the camera. You, you can hardly read it, but um, convergence is my little answer for my spirit spot of bringing multi-ages together, um, different professional interests together in independence this fall, October 6, 7, 8, 9. Roger said that he would be a speaker. There's going to be collaborations that are curated by other speakers, but in a more conversation, more picnic table like um, opportunity. There's a lot of, um, of uh, I don't know, fun stuff to do in town, you know, small town stuff to do. And so I'm leaving a lot of open space very intentionally. I'm scheduling open space so that people will go, you know what, let's get together over here because they're going to be talking on the, on the uh, topic of pain. I'm inviting the Oregon Pain Science Alliance president and entourage to come and just have a discussion in the afternoons. Roger's going to be a speaker in the morning. Um, if, if that's changed, Roger, don't tell me now because I don't have my box of Kleenex. But <laughs> um, you're telling me about McGinty. I mentioned... Um, the Ageless Awards, which is just inspiring to hear 
what people are doing as they continue to age. And sometimes, a lot of times, I mean, aging is just continuous living. So what they, whatever it is that they've contributed to society also benefits people who find themselves continuing to live. Um, as many have said, I'm an age I never imagined. I never imagined that. And I feel lucky that I was hired as a caregiver in almost a hundred different homes uh, last decade because I got to see like my future, my own aging future and realize that um, it's only scary if you're completely unprepared mm -hmm. and it gets less scary as you go, wait a minute, there's options even for things that seem like a, a shutdown, like you've gotten this diagnosis and that must just be it. It's like, no, even there, there's, there's joy, there's sharing, there's meaningfulness. I don't know. I could just go on and on. I'm excited about aging. So I, I call myself hashtag aging enthusiast well, because well, I am getting prepared for it. Yeah. Look at just us. Uh, probably there's people younger than us who would be saying, well, aren't you just uh, going around and in, uh, in an RV and gardening and taking care of the grandkids? That's the questions I got when I was leaving state employment. I said, no, I'm starting a business. Well, what do you need that for? You've got a, a pension fund. I'm not going to just sit around watching baseball. I found something that's going to keep me active mentally, physically, socially. And everyone says, I can't believe you're the age you are. You have your energy enthusiasm. Good. Thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> that yeah yeah you know is people oh you don't you don't look that old which is a really crazy statement to me now mm -hmm. um you don't look that old or you don't yeah. sound it you don't seem i don't know i'm not sensing a particular age and i'm like i just am everyone just looks the way that they look and mm -hmm. and i i i don't know i love that people are such a huge bouquet of different, you know, it's like your outward appearance. I see people often because I'm near a university that serves um, people who uh, don't hear or have diminished hearing at all ages, and also people who have both sight and hearing um, that they navigate life differently. I see. Um, red tip canes. I see people spelling into hands pretty often now, uh, especially now that we have a trolley that goes back and forth between Monmouth, Western Oregon University and Independence. Yeah, and right. so lots of writers and I'm just going, they don't care how old I look or how young I look. They don't care. You know, it's like I was pulled over. They're like, you need to talk to them, not just us. And I'm like, okay, are you staying at the hotel? You know, spell, spell, spell and responses and spelling back. And, you know, no, we're part of the school over, you know, and I'm just going, they don't care what age I look. <laughs> There's one thing that keeps coming to mind while you're talking, and it's in all, on the most serious side. Uh, if, uh, to have a resources available, because as I said, I'm coming from another culture, and uh, we very often don't think here about uh, the some gate people from other cultures put in front of them about aging, because they still mentally are in their own like, mindset from their culture where aging could be very different, maybe not so vibrant, maybe so not, uh, not so uh, open and open to uh, experiences. And I think what you do and what we're talking about, just to put things all out there for people to see and make their decision are from people from other cultures because uh, I was very shortly uh, taking care of my mom who had dementia. Then she went back to Russia because I just couldn't do it here because, you know, language and everything. And I'm telling you, I was, it was before my gerontology days. I was like dead. I was, I have no clue. I had no clue what to do, what, how to approach it. And there is 
there is a lot a lot of people like like i was at that time so i see one of the parts of uh any gerontology or any old age education advocacy is just to put things out there because the immigration uh i mean the, the uh, diversity of population is it's it's changing and we need to face it and what i don't like often when we you know this they take care of their own statement i really don't like it because very often we hide behind it we say oh don't worry about them they they take care of their <laughs> take care of their own that's what i mean good for them but maybe we need we need to uh try to help them because you cannot do things like that alone and in order to like, to open uh, our world to them to them if you if you miss that word Oh, you remind me of Isabel Tom, and I believe she said, I, I'm sorry if I'm misquoting, I believe she said that she had one or both parents in a place, and their background was different. And right at this moment, I cannot recall, but definitely Asian and um, their background was different. So to be in a place that did not have the familiarity of the culture that they lived almost all of their life, um, she said nothing wrong with the program, the building, the people, but it wasn't addressing them from their culture. And honestly, I didn't know what my culture was until I landed in an area that was not touristy in Mexico at, at one point. And especially when I went to Romania and I said, how do you know that we're Americans if we don't say anything? I feel like we're just, we blend in and it's like, oh, it, the way that you walk, the fact that you're wearing a man's belt in your belt loops, look around. No women are wearing men's belts. They We don't have belts like yeah. that for women. Even, Little even things in, that I'm like, what? Yeah. Even, even in Canada, I was just in Victoria, BC. You can tell the Americans, believe me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Way they dress, where they act, where they uh, how loud. Uh, loud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're wife, told we yeah, were we, we, we were swinging dead. our arms and talking loudly, and our mouths were really big. And I started to notice, and and it was this demure kind of you know this, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, I really am a sore thumb sticking <laughs> out, <laughs> you know. My wife it's, felt though people kept on asking us for directions. I guess we look like we fit in. Well, it's all the Pacific Northwest, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we, we stick out. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Roger, I don't remember. How did you end up in this situation? We know that, we know that um, Bill was ODOT and mm -hmm. then his mom and that figuring it out and finding things at, that changed the way that he thought he was going to be when he was retired. Um, but Roger, ha have you just, have you been pursuing this since college? I honestly don't remember. Okay. Shall we have a series of serendipitous, I'll call it fortunate changes. He started out with a career in law, 26 years as a trial attorney. I thought I had the world by the tail. Uh, when I burned out, famously burned out, and couldn't function as a lawyer, um, I didn't know what to do. So I dumped everything and looked for And the short version is I got a job in Salem, Oregon, at an assisted living, 44 people. I was the van driver, two days a week. I got to go to Fred Meyer. I got to go to the doctor. I got to be with Nana's. So if you say, where does it come from? That crash in my career 
was coupled with the death of my Nana, my only grandparent in her 90s. And she and I just fizzled. She never was in something like assisted living or nursing homes. And at one point she said, now, if I'm in the hospital, watch my hand because if I snap my fingers, say check, please, I'm checking out. She just had a sense of humor that was great. But what I found was that, uh, that my passion was there for a few days, but I didn't know it until on Friday, Michelle calls me in. I hand her the keys as usual. Uh, she said, do you want to be the activity director? And I was still standing up, just kind of checking out. And I said, don't we have an activity director? She said, well, she just walked out. I called corporate. You're already an employee. I said, I'm not trained. Um, do, you, do I get trained? And she said, I covered that. Be here today on Monday. Uh, be trained by corporate trainers. You start at 9 o'clock. It's on the calendar. I said, just a minute. I called my wife. Uh, and asked Kathy Sue uh, what she thought of it because we were struggling. I went from uh, hundreds of dollars an hour to seven fifty an hour, but I loved what I was doing. And she said the words that changed my life: "Take it. I haven't seen you this happy in years." I was the activity director, and I got trained by a corporate trainer from Portland. He said, "Just remember the these Bibles, birthday, and bingo." Michelle says, "Everybody loves you." Um, just call me if you have a problem. So I figured bad news, not much training. Good news, I can do anything I want. So I treated everybody like my nana. I think Bill will agree. You treat them like your loved one and they will become a substitute. And you pour yourself into making sure that you do what nana would have done or what she would have liked. My first event was, my first activity was sit and be fit. Great program out of Seattle. I never, or Spokane, I would never heard of it before. Six human beings showed up and asked where the activity director was. And I said, well, I'm the new one. They weren't happy campers. So I went through a half an hour of watching people's faces, uh, almost like they don't have anything except just a, a, no movement in their brain. They were just... Um, kind of ghosts of themselves, but they knew what to do. At the end, I thought to myself, my Nana wouldn't put up with this. So I played a word game with them for a few minutes and it worked. And they said, can we keep going? And I said, no, we're having fun, but I can do some more of it on Wednesday when we come back. The six became nine, became 15. Pretty soon I had 20 people coming at sit and be fit and i realized they weren't there for sit and be fit they were there to have fun they were there to use their brain because they're bored next uh, 10 years later after developing memorobics and having a, a clinical trial that took three years i was co-author of a medical journal article way above my pay grade but i retired as an activity director after two and a half three and a half years and tried it on my own translating neuroscience into a second language called plain English, teaching people how to do it themselves. And then in 2011, Jan Chakra twisted my arm one more time. I started teaching, retired a year ago this spring to go into research. And I'm now diving into the new research of non-pharmaceutical brain stimulation that is going to, I think, be the first go-to is do what people love to do and do more of it that's beneficial. So that's my story. And I'm only part way through my journey. I don't know where it's going to go, but I'm happy getting there quickly. Thank you. You did. You presented that really well. I can't do that. Not yet. Maybe in my 70s, I'll be able to go here to there to there. Oh, my goodness. I was first. I didn't know what caregivers were. I, and my neighbor said, oh, come in, I'll hire you Monday. You'll be perfect. <laughs> I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> and then in the next um, situation at Mennonite, the gal supervising there, I'm like, oh, I would love to be an activity director or something like that. Uh, we're seeing who you are. And it is the go into the home and, um, you know, 
develop the trust, um, want things to, you know, m meld to the way that person wants things to happen so, because maybe they physically can't do it anymore. So they are, they are doing it through you. And I'm, I'm talking dusting, you know, just three inches to the left. Nope. Nope. Turn that figurine just a little bit. Yes. You know, and that, that energy, that mental energy, you know, that, um, it goes into coaching me to, you know, to point to another thing that this person used as a tool. And I'm in the garage with this person who is, you know, just wanting to look at those tools again and talk about it, lift that one up, see how heavy it is. I had to use it this way, but I was clever. I, you know, just those wonderful moments of living and they knew that I was the right one. And that supervisor said, I don't hire anyone that I would not send to my own grandparents mm -hmm. without any, you know, compunction, no, no doubt, everything, you know, I know that this person will, will care enough to get them. So that's the mm -hmm. caregiving. And it isn't just, oh, you're, you know, you're, you're feeble, you know, be careful, don't fall or something like that, mm -hmm. but actually caring about who they are and getting to know them as a person. My favorite was the power went out in part of the house. So the TV couldn't be on and it was only warm in this one room. And this room was kind of a little bit of a museum of the past history of the person that I was serving. And oh, the stories that came out. And I'm like, yay, the TV's mm -hmm. off. And now I'm really knowing this person and what they are about, what's important to them, their core values, let alone where they've been or maybe something they accomplished, but just what was important to them. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. oh. I think of an analogy to the hospitality industry. We probably remember the uh, famous, I don't remember exact title was something like the dragon lady or something, Leona Helmsley, the hotel magnet. And it was something about that, you know, I can't teach attitude. Just get me people that care and smile and have good customer service feeling because just like caregiving, you can train them all you want, but if they're not going to have the compassion and the empathy and treat them like your grandma, can you teach that? That'd be really, really hard. And I don't think people like that will last. No, I think they have to go through some of that pain to go, oh, you know, if they have any capacity to, if there's a compassion genome thing that's just latent and needs to be unleashed, you know, go through that difficulty in a situation where you, you really are emotionally um, gripped and, and maybe that's when it all kicks in like, oh my goodness. So. Um, can, I a, can I make a comment about uh, something please. Roger said? And yeah, I want uh, to add something. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. You, you go because it's new. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you were talking about training. Yeah. <laughs> Are we no, being yeah. polite? Is that what we're doing, yeah. being polite right now? Okay, Natalia, what did you European, want to say, Natalia? You go for it. Eastern European background, so this is hard <laughs> for us. <laughs> oh, I got hooked to my chair. So real quick, Roger, you know, you're talking about activities and they're bored and that, and some of the things you, you didn't need the, the training. You thought outside the box, so to speak. And I think about, I run a memory cafe. Now, I don't do it like, where we have the same activity every month where, and I'm not gonna say what others do. I like to do something different every month, whether it's bringing somebody who does yoga and breathing or art therapy or music or games. Uh, what I love to do occasionally is one, maybe you know Dementia Map and they have the memory joggers. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's a perfect example because you say, a, a start a phrase like a rolling stone gathers no moss. And they may not remember what they had for breakfast 
or the person next to him's name they just met, but they'll remember phrases like that. Yes. And they love it. And even somebody with MCI, early stage dementia can do these games and they love coming to it, not just the socializing. We should talk about this next week because that's based upon a book called Surprise, Uncertainty and Mental Structure. It came out of Harvard about 20 years ago. And the key element is if, if your loved one who's older, anyone you're working with, Bill, if they can predict what's going to happen in that meeting, they'll be there, but it won't stick. But if you can surprise them with a, all of a sudden something surprises them, like you show up one day with these on and they laugh. And what are you laughing, what are you laughing at? There you go, Roger. <laughs> Yay, that's Yay. a winner. <laughs> so when you can, yeah, when that's you, a bell ringer. <laughs> when you can throw it. in something that throws them off, yeah, they suddenly their brain has to adjust. Earlier we talked about uh, you raised it, Christine that, uh, gee, how old are you? Gee, you're still doing this, and you're really sharp for that age. We came up and teach people in our ageism models and things to do. When someone is engaged in conversation with Bill or Roger, uh, we're of a certain age and I'll get that every so often. They would say, "How after, after the conversation, they'll say, how old are you anyway? The answer can be a two digit number. Mm -hmm. And they'll say the dead end, gee, you sound real sharp for someone that age. That's a bad compliment. Mm -hmm. But if you say, I was born in and give the year, the person who's younger has to realize you're talking living history here. This mm -hmm. lived through the Cold War. Mm -hmm. He lived through this. He lived through that. So it switches from the younger person sort of having the upper hand to you're only this age. The other thing that it does is it gives the person a chance to say, I was born in, and you can fine tune it. What I like to say when I really fine tune, it, I was born one week before Dewey lost to Truman. You do the math. Yeah, I was going to say, I was born when Truman was still president. I used to think it was Eisenhower, but it was an election year. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Natalia wanted to say something. I want to hear what she had to say. Oh, it was just... Uh... Hello? Oh, yes. Oh, You're yes. back. You're back. Uh, you talk about training, and uh, I how what I did when... when... I will talk about training when I went to Nancy Hackler for adult day, day services more than a year ago. It was driving me insane. She didn't let me do anything. I was there for at least four first, like four first uh, visits, just sitting and watching. And when I say, Nancy, but I came here to help. And she said, Natalia, I know you can mix the salad. <laughs> but you and it, it's really important for training to see and watch how other people do because they very often want to jump in and start doing things, you know. Mm -hmm. But to take a quiet moment and invest ourselves, all of ourselves, into watching and uh, getting that experience in without fiddling or doing things, it's very, very important. That's how we get to the core, to the depths of it. Yay. Well, I should ring the bell again because we're at that point. I'm going to say that if you all can come back next week, <clears throat> I know there are others who plan to be on the screen as well. If we can hear more about memorobics, maybe from Roger, and then you have a memory cafe. Is that right, Bill? Mm -hmm. And about? Natalia, you've got this Breaks for thing better that you're launching. Yes, yeah. I and, and I need to understand it better. I need to have a word picture. I'm going to say convergence dash experience dot com is a place to go to see this 
concept that I have of also collaborations sounding very McGinty. Yeah. Um, Roger, where what's just one contact piece of information as we finish this hour for you? Uh, we've got a website. It's a mind ramp, like a brain ladder, except easier to get up. Mindramp.org. Mindramp. <laughs> dot org mm-hmm. bill how about you what how what do you want people to find first uh well i put a few things in the chat but the easiest without getting into something that's encrypted it would be cohen like my last name c-o-h-e-n caregiving support.com cohen caregiving support.com our website has a lot of good information caregiving support got Dot com and your last name is Cohen. Natalia, do you invite people to get in contact with you? Uh, it's only by, by email because I don't have, it's a pilot project, so there is nothing uh, solid yet, but I'm absolutely happy to answer email, LinkedIn contacts, whatever. Wonderful. Can you share yeah. your, your email? email? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, she's going she's gonna to type it in. Yay that we are just spreading this out over two Wednesdays. So 9 a.m. Pacific time. I got to use the same time for everyone. There are other people who are aiming towards the 19th, um, July 19th to pop in. Mm -hmm. And we have Natalia.Kasparovich at PCC. Uh, oops. Oh, it popped away. Where is it? This is dot edu. Mm-hmm. <gasps> edu. That makes sense. That mm-hmm. makes sense. Goodbye, everyone. See you next week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so grateful.